We often receive contradictory advice, especially in the form of Proverbs. Right? He who hesitates is lost. Look before you leap. Clothes make the man. Don't judge a book by its cover. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. All good things come to he who waits. These contradictions don't make these statements untrue. Each of these statements is good advice in certain situations. There are situations in which it's good advice to take stop before acting, and there are situations in which immediate action is required. There are situations in which waiting one's turn guarantees the best results, and there are situations in which some self-advocacy is required. So the book of Michelet gives us contradictory advice on how to deal with a fool. Michelet 26, verse 4, tells us not to answer a fool, and the very next verse, verse 5, tells us to answer a fool. Now these verses are about speech. Should we speak to those we deem to be fools? We're not even asking how we speak to them yet. We're asking actually a more basic question, a first order question of should we even speak to them at all? So the first test of the civil treatment of a fool is whether we even owe them the civility of engagement. Because the very act of speaking, after all, not ignoring someone, not dismissing them, but speaking to them is an act of civility. That in and of itself, the very act of speech is Derek Eretz towards another person. And one verse says, no, al ta'ane kasil. Don't answer a fool. And the other verse says, yes, ane kasil. Answer a fool. Now, since these contradictory uh, verses are not scattered in diverse parts of the book of Proverbs, but are actually right next to one another, side by side, I think we have to assume that they don't cancel one another out. They don't render each other untrue. I think we have to assume, just like the contradictory English Proverbs that I just cited, that each is probably good advice in a particular situation. Sorting out which is the better advice in which situation, that's the challenge that lies before us. And I don't mean it's the challenge that lies before us in this shiur. I mean it's the challenge that lies before us each and every day in the moment of our lives. When to engage a fool, when not to engage a fool. And if engaging a fool, how to engage the fool. In any given moment, how do I know which situation I'm in? A situation in which I should engage a fool, a situation in which I should not. What does the decision turn on? What does it depend on? So we're going to explore uh, a few possibilities. Let's first flesh out Proverbs itself on this particular question. Does Proverbs endorse one particular view over the other? And on what does it depend? Perhaps it depends on the fool, on the seal. Perhaps verses 4 and 5 give us different advice because they are imagining different kinds of fools to whom we should respond in different ways. Are there different kinds of fools? Well, to answer that question, I gathered together uh, some sources for you on page 3. Most of these are from Proverbs, as I said before. And they give us some insight into the biblical conception of fools, or rather the, the conception of fools that's in the book of Proverbs specifically. What are the qualities that the book of Proverbs attributes to fools? So if you take a look at the first two verses that I listed, you'll see that they focus on the fool's wickedness, right? Verse uh, 23 of chapter 10, a fool is someone who takes pleasure in zima. I know the translation there says mischief. Um, zima is a little stronger than mischief. Uh, zima is, is evil, particularly of sexual obscenity, um, wickedness around sexuality. So a fool is someone who is, is, uh, is wicked, who takes pleasure in evil, in zima. And that's reinforced um, by the verse from the psalm. Here a fool, and the word used now is nava. We have several words for fools. That's interesting. I think we only have one word for a wise man in the Bible. But we have several words for fool. We have kasil and evil and naval. And the fool, the naval, is someone who sees only corruption and evil. They don't uh, even believe in the existence of virtue. And presumably, therefore, they don't practice it. Now, it's true that the naval's um, wickedness in this particular case is based on a prior um, belief that fosters that wickedness, right? The belief that ain Elohim, there is no God. Um, in the view of Proverbs, it's that belief which in general um, uh, emboldens people to do evil. 
Now these ver- first two verses connect the fool with wickedness. But the next two verses emphasize the fool's ignorance or intellectual deficit, if you will. The fool in Proverbs 1, 7 despises wisdom. Now it's an evil, chokma umusar bazu. He despises wisdom. Or in Proverbs 1.22, the fool hates knowledge. Ksilim yisna uda'at. So at times, Proverbs defines the fool or describes the fool as wicked and at times as ignorant. And the two are somewhat intertwined in Proverbs, right? They just place emphasis alternatingly on one or the other. The fool is primarily wicked. And that's because, uh, and, and because of that, he despises knowledge. Or the fool is primarily ignorant, and because of his ignorance, um, he is therefore wicked. So they're intertwined, but they will sometimes speak as if he's primarily wicked or primarily ignorant. Now, interestingly, the same assessment is made by Plato. Plato tries to give an account of vice and folly. And in one of his early dialogues, the Protagoras, Plato um, has Socrates say that no one makes mistakes um, or behaves foolishly, willingly. Mistakes in action are due to mistaken beliefs about the merits of, of different goals or ends or things that we desire. So if vice and folly are grounded in ignorance, he holds, then virtue is achieved by acquiring knowledge. The fool just needs instruction. But in a later work, in the Republic, Plato gives a different account of vice, and he attributes it to a lack of, uh, not to a lack of knowledge, but to the irrational parts of the soul, sort of the Greek equivalent of the Yitzhar Hara, right? This just this evil inclination, these appetites and passions in us that are not controlled by reason. And for virtue to be achieved, the irrational parts of the soul, um, the appetites, the passions, they have to be subjugated. Um, they have to be trained to obey what reason commands. And that kind of obedience is not the result of intellectual understanding. It's the result of habituation over time. So if vice and folly are grounded in a wicked impulse, if you will, then the fool needs not instruction, not information, but discipline in the sense of training. He needs commands. It means prohibitions that he can't disobey. He has to have obedience inculcated through habituation in order to control and subjugate these wicked desires. So similarly, um, we see that according to Proverbs, a fool may be wicked or a fool may be ignorant. But what else does does Proverbs tell us about the fool? Well, the next three verses on page three convey a rather pessimistic view of the fool as incorrigible. In these verses, a key attribute of the biblical fool is that he or she spurns discipline or correction by those who are older and wiser. They can't be taught. So Proverbs 15, 5, a fool spurns the discipline of his father. Or Proverbs 23, 9, which tells us not to bother even speaking to a fool because they're just going to disdain and despise your reasonable words. According to Proverbs 12, 15 to 16, the fool doesn't accept advice because he thinks he's right. He thinks his path is right in his eyes. So unlike the wise man, he will not listen to advice. So the fool in Proverbs may be wicked, he may be ignorant, but either way, he seems to be incorrigible. Right? He cannot be corrected. So what are we to do with people who are incorrigible? Well, Proverbs gives us an answer. It's not a very pleasant one. The rabbis we'll see are going to give us a different answer. But first, let's look at Proverbs' answer. In keeping with its general pessimism about the fool, uh, Proverbs tells us that our only resort is to the rod. Uh, I've given you one more quote, Proverbs 19, 29. Punishments are in store for scoffers and blows for the backs of fools. Mahulamot legev ksilim. Scoffers and fools are often classed together. Later in one of our rabbinic stories, we'll have a scoffer. It's a sign that he's a fool, right? So scoffers and fools are coupled together. This idea that the only resort for the incorrigible fool is the rod, right? This is an idea that we see also at the beginning of chapter 26 of Mishlei. So if you go back to text one, which is all of chapter 26, um, let's take a look at, at the first verse. The first verse tells us that honor, kavod, is not befitting a fool 
A fool deserves no honor, no kavod. And as the, as the people who have been participating in my elective know, um, learning, uh, I'm sorry, uh, foundational to the idea of, of kavod, of human um, dignity, or kavod is the idea that all human persons have a certain guaranteed and inalienable immunity from humiliation, degradation, and abuse. They can't be degraded, humiliated, or physically harmed. But according to Proverbs, the fool, by virtue of his foolishness, forfeits his kvod. He forfeits his immunity to abuse. Lo nave l'ksil kvod. He deserves, therefore, no honor and, therefore, no protection. So a fool is fair game. In fact, his very humanity is in question, as we see if you just continue to verse 3. There, he's grouped with animals, like the horse who can be whipped or the donkey who can be coerced with a bridle. So the fool should be beaten with a rod. Veshevet legev ksilim. So if you believe that the fool has lost that which makes him human, right? if you believe that the fool is little more than a beast, then you'll believe he has no claim to dignity, no claim to the kavod owing to humans, no claim, therefore, to your regard, to your protection, to your civility, and will best be dealt with violently. To be clear, Proverbs isn't just saying just ignore the fool, right? When it says don't answer the fool, it's not just saying ignore the fool. It's a little more aggressive than that. Look at verse 10 in Mishlei 26. One who stops a fool is like one who stops a flood. In other words, fools are dangerous and they must be stopped. And if so, Proverbs would have us reach for the rod. All right. But what if the fool is the one with the rod, the one with power? What do we do then? Well, based on everything that we've learned about fools in Proverbs, let's go back now to look in more detail at our contradictory verses, verses 4 and 5. And we're going to try to make sense of them. And what I hope becomes immediately apparent is that one of these verses is completely consistent with the general tenor of the book of Proverbs as I've just described it, and one of them is not. One of them stands out as utterly unique, maybe even radical. Remember, the general tenor of the book of Proverbs is that fools may be wicked, they may be ignorant, but either way, the most important thing about them is they are incorrigible. Talking to them is useless. Don't waste your time. So one can be uncivil to them right off the bat just by not engaging to them at all, right? You don't even extend to them the civility of speech. Don't dignify them by speaking to them. In fact, show them the back of your hand. That's all they deserve. That's the view that prevails throughout Proverbs, and it's the view expressed in which of the two verses, really? Number four, right? Don't answer a fool. And so then it hits us that verse five is an utter anomaly. It's a radical surprise because it doesn't just contradict verse four. It contradicts all of Proverbs. It expresses a sentiment that breaks with the rest of the book of Proverbs because verse five says, no, go ahead, answer the fool, engage the fool, speak to the fool. Why? Well, we have to dig a little bit further in these verses because there are more words in each of these verses. And we want to see if those words hold any clues um, to the difference between a situation in which we should engage a fool and a situation in which we should not engage a fool. Now, each verse gives us a reason for the advice it has offered. Verse 4 says, Do not answer the fool lest you become like him. Pentish velo gam ata. Do not answer a fool, in other words, if the only change it's going to bring about is a change in you, and a negative change at that, making you no better than him. Don't answer a fool if the only outcome is that you too will become a fool. How do you become his equal, no better than the fool? Well, there's only one other word in this verse we've, we've yet to talk about, and it's one that sheds light on that question. Ke'ivalto. The verse doesn't say, don't answer a fool, period. The verse says, don't answer a fool, ke'ivalto, in accordance with his folly. And this, of course, brings us to the civility debate that's raging right now in the United States. As you know, two years ago, Michelle Obama quite famously said, and she was quite rightly applauded for this, when they go low, we go high. But today, many are clamoring for a different approach. Fight fire with fire, they say. So Proverbs 26.4, I 
I think is the Michelle Obama verse, right? This is Michelle Obama's verse. Do not answer the uncivil and foul-mouthed opponent according to his incivility and foulness, lest you become like him. All right? Don't answer him ivalto, in the same way that he has spoken to you. And you will become like him, an uncivil, intemperate, bombastic fool. The verse says, in deciding whether to answer or not, and more important, in deciding how to answer, in the same uncivil tone or not, be guided by the outcome. If it won't change your opponent, and moreover, if it will only change you, debase you, lower you to the same uncivil station as your opponent, then don't engage, or at least don't get swept up in the exchange of incivilities. But what about verse 5? It gets a little more problematic. Well, here too, when deciding whether to answer a fool, be guided by the outcome. You should answer a fool, pen yihye chacham nav, lest he thinks himself wise. Now, if we skip down to verse 12, very quickly of that same chapter, the very last verse uh, on your handout for, for this section, verse 12 actually tells us that the one thing worse than a fool is a person who's wise in his own eyes. It's actually not the same thing. They actually make a, a gradation, a distinction between them. Verse 12 is distinguishing between a fool uh, who says foolish things and a person who actually really is beginning to believe them <laughs> and who really thinks he's right and is wise in his own eyes. They say there's actually more hope for a fool than someone who is right in his own eyes, who has become entrenched and is incorrigible. A person who is wise in his own wise eyes is too far gone, but the fool perhaps has some hope and can be changed. So verse 5 seems to be advising us. Answer a fool. If in so doing, you can save him from that fate, fate of becoming an entrenched and incorrigible fool. If by answering the fool, you can make him aware of his folly and then prevent him from that even worse fate of thinking and believing he is wise when he is not. If, in other words, there is a hope and a chance of change. But there's something odd still about verse 5, and we're not going to have an answer to this oddity until quite a bit later. And that is, it also uses this term, ke'ivato, according to his folly. What can this possibly mean? Answer the fool according to his folly so that he will see he is mistaken. So does that mean if he's uncivil and uninformed, you should answer him in a way that's uncivil and uninformed in response? I don't understand that. How is that going to educate him to his unfoolishness? So that's a puzzle. Rabbinic sources are going to help us understand um, this puzzle and answer this question, what it means to say, answer the fool according to his folly, and uh, we will get to that. But um, before we turn to the innovations and the nuances that are in the rabbinic sources, I just want to sum up where we are with Proverbs. So Proverbs as a whole is pessimistic. It holds out very little hope. The fool is weak, wicked or ignorant, but either way, incorrigible. And for that reason, engaging the fool is useless. It will change nothing. Engaging them on their own uncivil terms is even worse, since not only does it not change them, it sullies and it debases you. However, Ignoring them is also not possible because they're dangerous. So our only options are coercive and punitive. You reach for the rod because the fool, like an animal, is afforded no dignity and has no claim to civility. In stark contrast to that general position is one verse, Michelet 26.5. Clinging to the hope that perhaps the fool is not completely, not too far gone, is not incorrigible, Verse 5 urges us to answer the fool, engage the fool, so that he will not believe that he is wise when he is not. Show him where he's wrong. But how exactly? Ke'ivalto? How can answering him according to his folly, does that mean in the same uncivil and uninformed terms, how can that help him see he's not as wise as he believes? Wouldn't he feel attacked, become defensive, and double down? We will leave that aside. We've explained the contradictory advice in Proverbs based on different notions, perhaps, of the fool, right? A prevailing pessimistic notion that the fool is incorrigible, incorrigible, can't be engaged. And then the less prominent but, but optimistic notion that perhaps a fool is, is corrigible, is correctable, and should be engaged. Now, the rabbis are also going to try to make sense of the contradictory verses, and they're also going to do it by applying them to different situations. And that's what we see in 
your source number three. It's going to be different from the one that we've just deduced, however, from reading Proverbs. In their first attempt, in, in their attempt to explain this uh, contradiction, they're going to focus on a distinction that we have yet to consider, and that is the topic that's under discussion at any given time. One should answer a fool, right? So verse 5 applies, on matters of Torah, bedivrei Torah, but not on ordinary matters, bemile de alma. In other words, it all depends on the, on the issue at hand. So on some issues, you engage in the hope of bringing change, but on some issues, you do not. It depends on the issue. So the sugya, as so often happens, gives us some kind of important overarching statement or principle. You must respond to the fool when important matters are at stake, basically. And for the rabbis, that's divrei Torah. Um, now, there are then a number of stories that follow. And some of the, these stories seem to have a rather um, constrained notion of divrei Torah. They really mean quite literally sort of talking about scripture, if you will. But there's no reason not to think of Torah in a more expansive way, as the rabbis themselves often do, and to ask ourselves, you know, in our world, what do we consider to be divrei Torah, matters of Torah, things that are important enough that we should enter the fray, that we should answer the fool? Um, there's a, the source uh, number four um, from Jeffrey Guhin, I think is an attempt to help us answer the question, or actually his statement is not prescriptive, it's really descriptive. He's trying to explain how and why it is that certain issues become politically or morally salient to us, such that we are willing, in fact, almost feel compelled to enter the fray and to answer the annoying fool. Uh, and Guhin tells us why we choose to answer fools on some matters and not others, why we choose to die on some hills and not others. And Guhin asserts that issues take on moral salience for us, political and moral salience for us, to the extent that they are central to our individual or community identity. Those are the things over which we will engage. Now, different individuals and different communities may have different ideas of the most morally salient issue of the day, and it's not that one is wrong and one is right. It's simply that the core identity of one will be touched by a certain issue, and the core identity of another will be touched by a different issue. So on Wednesday night, Daniel talked about two issues that have different degrees of moral salience for two different communities. They're both morally salient, but they have different degrees of moral salience for two different communities. For American Jews, the struggle over the Kotel is a struggle over their core identity as Jews. It's a symbol of their inclusion or exclusion, their acceptance or rejection as equal partners in Am Yisrael. Can Israelis ask them to be quiet and courteous about a matter of such personal moral salience? I'm not sure. They can try. And for Israeli Jews, the struggle over alternative marriage is a struggle over their core identity as, I don't know, as Israelis, as Israeli Jews, as Jews, as citizens of a civil and democratic society, I've heard all of those. And for them, that's personal, and that's pressing. But the fact that alternative marriage is morally and politically salient to Israeli Jews does not increase or decrease the moral salience of the Kotel for American Jews, and vice versa. Communities don't need to share the same list of pressing moral and political issues, the same agenda. Different communities, whatever their similarities are, they do have different identities, and each will prioritize what is salient to its core identity, and it's absurd to think otherwise. American Jews and Israeli Jews are not required to, to agree on what is the most moral uh, or the moral issue of greatest importance, but the civil thing to do, the path of Derech Eretz, is to respect what is morally salient to the other, and perhaps even to cheer them on as they pursue it. Moral progress, as it happens, is not a battle with one front. It's a battle with many fronts. And I can fight for what's of moral salience to me while recognizing that it may not be of moral salience to someone else, but asking them to be civil enough to cheer me on. And I can fight for what's of moral salience to me while cheering on others who are fighting for what is of moral salience to them. 
It is not a zero-sum game. And in an age of multiple moral challenges, we need to be multitaskers. And so with any two communities, our different agendas need not be in competition. They need not tear us apart if we have the courtesy to recognize that my moral fight doesn't negate or invalidate yours, and your moral fight doesn't negate and invalidate mine. So we were given a, a general statement in this first sugya, Source 3, that you looked at, the first part of the sugya, Source 3. Engage the fool when important matters are at stake, divrei Torah, recognizing that we might prioritize these important matters differently based on their centrality to our core identity, recognizing that Derek Eretz requires us to accept that friends and allies may prioritize things differently, and that's okay. But what follows the general statement um, is then a series of stories with actual examples of encounters with fools, and we see from these stories that it's just much more complicated and nuanced than the first general statement would um, suggest. And that's the great thing about rabbinic sources, of course, never, if they give you a general principle, never stop there. You know, go on and read all of the Masim and all the stories and so on. Um, in fact, it turns out that it's not even really true that we should always disengage on non-Torah matters and that we should always engage only in Torah matters. So the long sugi that um, follows presents us with a number of examples. First, we're going to have a couple of examples that embody or exemplify verse 4. Do not answer a fool. Do not engage in dialogue with a fool. Ke'ivalto. And then we'll have examples of verse 5 where there is engagement and dialogue with a fool. In some sense, ke'ivalto. We'll come back to that. And as we read these stories, we will see that there are multiple variables at work and multiple variables in play, not just one of matters of Torah, not matters of Torah. Our response to the fool depends on more than topic, Torah and non-Torah. In fact, as we move through the examples provided by, these, um, by the sugya, I think we're going to see three different approaches to the ethics of engagement with a fool. The first approach I would call a consequentialist approach, in which the potentially harmful consequences of the fool's speech, the fool's words, play the key role in determining whether and how to engage. Right? So again, looking at the, 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 the stories that are presented first towards the bottom of source three. So these are the first two cases we get in our sugya. These uh, cases involve slander. A man says of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi that he himself is the true father of Rabbi Yehuda's children. Slandering Rabbi Huda's wife as an adulteress and Rabbi Huda's children as mamzerim. And these are not insignificant charges. They have severe legal consequences. Similarly, a man says of Rabbi Chia that he himself is Rabbi Chia's true father. Slandering Rabbi Chia's mother as an adulteress and Rabbi Chia himself as a mamzer. And these slanderers are described uh, as zepanim. They are bold-faced. They are insolent. Now, these examples concern ordinary matters, right? So the rabbis are obviously bringing them as an example of, of which piece of advice, which one should we follow here? Ordinary matters, not Torah? Don't answer a fool, right? This is, this, is, this is for you. You have no duty or obligation to answer the fool. Um, don't engage. This is exactly the kind of case the rabbis say which is governed by the dominant approach in Proverbs. Not just verse 4, but the dominant approach in Proverbs. These are wicked people. They're bent on belittling and humiliating others through slanderous speech. Right? Um, and let me just pause to say that as with any of these examples, any similarities to contemporary world leaders is entirely not coincidental. Um, <laughs> but on the view that, that such people are um, incorrigible, right? and stooping to their level by trading insults or, or dignifying their lies as legitimate topics of conversation, it's not going to change them and it's only going to debase you. But their lies are dangerous. Right? Still carrying over that view of Proverbs. Their lies are dangerous. The social consequences are real. So here the rabbis agree with Proverbs. You don't engage them, but you also don't have the option to ignore them. They must be stopped, even if it requires an extreme measure. So in these stories, each of the slanders is, slanderers is offered what I think must be the equivalent of a Molotov cocktail. That's all I can think. <laughs> a drink that makes them explode uh, and, and they die. So these first examples follow Michelet in providing a simple 
unnuanced lesson in how to stop a fool. The assumption is he's bent on harm, he's incorrigible, and his attack strikes at your core identity, right? So the calculus is this. Rabbi Yehuda doesn't owe the slanderer a response. It's not a matter of Torah. He doesn't owe him a civil response, and certainly not an uncivil, an, an uncivil response, because that would only debase Rabbi Yehuda. However, because the slanderer has crossed a line and he's landed an attack that can have devastating consequences for the identity of the rabbi, the identity of his wife, the identity of his children, which is going to have consequences on their marriage rights, he also can't just be ignored. He has to be stopped. This line of thought has surfaced in recent years as people consider the limits of tolerance for harmful speech, especially as that speech espouses harmful ideologies, is more than just insults, but really espouses harmful ideologies, and especially when you yourself are the target of that harmful speech and that ideology. In other words, it's all well and good for a non-Mexican American to say that declaring all Mexican immigrants as rapists is hateful speech, but it must be tolerated in a free society in the name of free speech. Can we honestly expect a Mexican-American to adopt this posture? Do we think the capacity to tolerate hate speech should be the same for the targets of that speech as it is for the bystanders? Or is it legitimate for differently situated people to respond differently, for different people to play different roles, depending on the moral salience for them of the issue? depending on the extent to which it touches and even threatens their core identity. We've often heard that free speech has a price. We have to sacrifice a little of our comfort and safety and allow things to be said that make us very uncomfortable, perhaps. But consider this. The price of the free and unchecked speech of the slanderer in our rabbinic stories, like the price of the free and unchecked speech of the white nationalist or the homophobe, or the misogynist in our own day, is rarely paid by the speaker. It's paid by the targets of his speech. It's paid by those who haven't generated the speech, who have done nothing wrong, and ho who are in fact harmed and victimized by the speech. When an absolute commitment, an absolutist commitment to free speech allows powerful leaders to call Muslims animals and Mexicans rapists, and asylum seekers criminals, who pays the price? Not the powerful leader. The Muslim child who is bullied at school. The Mexican-American citizen who can suddenly no longer find a job. The asylum seeker escaping domestic abuse whose child is two years old and is taken from her and sent thousands of miles away. The price is imposed on them, though they have said and done nothing hateful. Is that a price anyone? has a right to impose on another in the name of free speech? Does such speech and do such speakers deserve the courtesy of tolerance from everyone, even its victims? Text five is a, is a passage from Devante Torrientes, I don't owe you my tolerance, how civil discourse functions to uphold systems of oppression. And it's a point of view we need to think about. This is his claim. It's time for us to do away with the idea that we must be respectful or courteous to be entitled to our rights. Politeness isn't a requirement when we are confronting anyone who uses their political and social power to further disenfranchise us. We are, our, we are now charged with ushering in a new era of normalized discomfort in which people in positions of power know that in this fight for our humu humanity, we will not concede the raw power of our indignation. In this age of entitlement by those with problematic or seemingly unpopular views, remember this, I don't owe you my tolerance, especially not when my life is at stake. Torianti says, hateful speech and intolerant ideas, especially issuing from persons in a position of privilege and power, exact a price on me, on my body, my life, and that's not a price I'm prepared to pay for your freedom to speak. I've been made uncomfortable for too long so that you can speak freely. No more. The words and ideas that threaten my body and my life, words and ideas you have told me I must tolerate 
so that you can have the privilege of your freedom, do not deserve my courteous respect. They deserve the full measure of my unvarnished indignation and outrage. And that should make you, the speaker, uncomfortable. You should be the one to pay the price for hateful words and speech, not me. Well, there's a certain logic to that. You can say terrible things, absolutely, as long as you bear the cost, the suffering, the pain of it, and not someone else. I think, exploding drinks aside, the point of the story of Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Chia, right, is that Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Chia see to it that the slanderer, and not them or their families, pays the price for their hateful, harmful words. But a parallel story in a different tractate resolves a very similar situation in a very different way. This is text six. This is also from the Babylonian Talmud, Bava Metziah 84a, and it contains a very comic story in which a Roman noblewoman casts aspersions on the legitimacy of the children of Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Ishmael be Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Elazar be Rabbi Shimon, the very famous fat rabbis. But here, the offending matron is not handed a Molotov cocktail to drink. Instead, um, Rabbi Eliezer, uh, Rabbi Elazar, excuse me, and Rabbi uh, Shimon, uh, sorry, Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Elazar, there's too many names here, Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Elazar, answer her, they engage her. And this prompts the anonymous voice of the Talmud to ask, wait a minute, why did they answer her at all? This is a case of where Proverbs 26.4 applies. Proverbs 26.4 says, do not answer a fool. Why do they answer her? How is this case different from the one in Shabbat? First of all, the noble woman doesn't seem to be motivated by a desire to slander the rabbis. She doesn't seem to be wicked. She just seems to be mistaken, and quite understandably so, actually. Based on an empirical observation, <laughs> she draws what is, in her view, a perfectly reasonable conclusion. Now, the text says that these rabbis have such enormous abdomens, right, that when they stand belly to belly, a pair of oxen can pass underneath them without touching either of them. And she says, you know, how do these guys engage in sexual intercourse? It just seems incredible to her. Their children can't be theirs. Their abdomens are so large, they can't possibly have intimate contact with their, their wives. Their abdomens are going to get in the way. And so she concludes mistakenly, not viciously, mistakenly, that their children are not their own. The dialogue that ensues is a classic case of, like, in British comedy, you know, they always have double entendre where people are talking past each other. They think one is talking about X and they're actually talking about Y. And, right, yeah. and that's what happens and what follows. When she says, your children can't be yours, the rabbis rather vainly imagine that the noblewoman is admiring their large genitals and assuming that they're far too large to have intercourse with an ordinary woman. So the rabbis assure her, no, no, our wives are larger than ours meaning our wives' private organs are larger than ours, and so they can accommodate us. Now it's the noblewoman's turn to misunderstand because she thinks we're talking about bellies, abdomens. So she thinks the response means your wives have equally large abdomens. Um, that only confirms my conclusion. How do you two ever you know, get together when you have these giant bellies in the way? So she says, all the more so is it impossible for you to be intimate with your wives with such large bellies on both sides. So the rabbis at this point, you know, this is when it cl the, the, the comedy clears itself up, and they say, no, 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 l believe us, we're, we're capable of sexual intimacy. The Talmud says they offer two ans answers, one of which is our genitals are just as big as our bellies, everything's fine, and the other one is, no, no, love compresses the flesh. When you get down to it, everything's fine. Okay. So intercourse is possible. Now, as in the previous story, right, the noble woman has, has spoken in a way that, that would have devastating consequences, consequences for the identity of, of the rabbis, their wives, um, the moral stature of their wives, right, the marriage rights of their children. So it would seem to be the same kind of case. Similarly, her words cannot be ignored, right, because they have dangerous consequences, um, and she must be stopped, right? So it's, it's not a matter of Torah, so you don't have an obligation to respond. Right? It's, it's a fool to whom you can just you can ignore, but the consequences could be devastating, um, and therefore the person must be stopped. So, so far, it's really very much like the story of Rabbi Yehud and Rabbi Hia. He has to be stopped. But because her words stem from ignorance rather than wickedness and from a plausible misunderstanding of the circumstances as she sees them, 
And because she's not incorrigible, therefore, because it really is a mistake that could be corrected with more information. And perhaps because she occupies a position of power. This is a noble woman. Rabbis are not going to go around exploding noble women, <laughs> Roman no noble women, in the Roman Empire. So let's not forget that power plays some role here, too. She is in a position of power. And so, because it's ignorance rather than a willful wickedness, because it seems corrigible rather than incorrigible, and because she's in a position of power, then even though it's not a matter of Torah, and the rabbis don't have to answer, they do answer because of the consequences. They answer, they educate her, they resolve the danger. So the first approach that we've seen is a kind of consequentialist approach to the ethics of engagement um, and to the question of when and how we respond to the fool. It's determined by the potential harmful consequences. There are real world consequences. Those consequences determine the rabbi's response. In the case of the incorrigible fool, who's bent on evil, the potentially harmful consequences seem to dictate disengagement and possibly even coercive action, or at least not tolerating the pain on our own bodies. In the case of the corrigible fool, engagement that corrects the fool's ignorance presents itself as an option. Now the second approach to encountering a fool appears in the sugya's next story, and this is a duty-oriented approach. In the story involving Rabbi Gamliel, engagement is determined not by considering the consequences. Engagement is quite simply a duty. The three stories involving Rabbi Gamliel follow a set pattern. Rabbi Gamliel he gives an interpretation of a scriptural verse, and it's objected to by a certain student. He scoffs at him, and as we know, scoffers and fools are very closely aligned. So he's playing the role of the fool in this story. All three cases involve a matter of Torah, specifically Torah interpretation. And we know that in matters of Torah, one has a duty to answer the fool. That's the rabbinic view. So instead of rebuking the student, silencing him, demanding his unquestioning obedience and respect, Rabban Gamliel takes the time to demonstrate the student's error and the plausibility of Rabban Gamliel's interpretation. The story seems simple enough, right? Sometimes students say foolish things, but they deserve a civil answer. But is that really what's happening in this story? Because on closer examination, the student isn't really the one who appears foolish in this story. Raman Gamliel is the one who appears foolish. Raman Gamliel interprets these verses in ways that are not only implausible, they are patently, totally impossible. He interprets a verse in Jeremiah to mean that women will give birth every day. He interprets a verse in Ezekiel to mean that trees will produce fruit every day. And a verse in Psalms to mean that the land will produce cakes and fine wool garments every day. And the student laughs and scoffs because these things are impossible and therefore will not happen, not just based on empirical evidence, but he's got a proof. He's got Kohelet 1.9 that says there is nothing new under the sun. The order of nature, the course of nature doesn't change. And I have to ask you, if you were there and you were listening to this conversation, honestly, who would you deem a fool? And who would you deem wise? If, if we're going to be honest for a moment. I know that in the rabbinic mind, Scoffers and fools are one and the same, so it's clear that for the author, the scoffing student is the fool. The plain meaning of the story is you shouldn't rebuke or, explo or, or explode the scoffing fool. You should educate him. And yet, surely the storyteller could have told us that story by having the rabbi say something reasonable <laughs> and the student ask a, fool que a foolish question. The storyteller chose to tell the story in a way that I think communicates something more. He put foolish-sounding words in the mouth of the rabbi. It's the rabbi who sounds foolish. He predicts plainly impossible things. And it's the scoffing student's words that seem utterly sensible, denying plainly impossible things. Perhaps the storyteller is telling us not to be too confident in our ability to determine who is wise and who is a fool. And if I can't be completely sure who is, fool, who is a fool and who is wise, then perhaps I owe the duty of a response, a civil and informed response, to everyone. The Robin Gamliel stories deal with the duty of answering a fool and even raise questions about whether we ever even know if someone is a fool. According to the principle laid out at the very beginning of the sugya in Source 3, one has a duty to answer a fool in matters of Torah. Robin Gamliel is interpreting Torah, so he has a duty to respond to the scoffing student. The third approach to encounters with fools 
is the virtue-oriented approach. We've had a consequentialist approach, a duties-oriented approach, and now a virtue-oriented approach. And that can be seen in the very next story in the Sugya, involving Hillel. In the story, Hillel will answer a fool, a particularly provoking fool, though he has no duty to do so because the topic is not Torah by any means. So first the story. The story. Two men make a bet. For 400 zoos, says one man, he will provoke the usually patient Hillel to anger. So he goes to Hillel at the most inopportune time. He's preparing for Shabbat. He's undressed, he's washing his head, and the man stands at the door and calls out to him. Hillel puts on a robe, and he comes outside, only to be greeted by a silly question of no particular importance or urgency. I would think that if you're coming to my door on the eve of Shabbat while I'm trying to get ready, it better be an important question, yes? A question of no particular importance and no particular urgency. Why are the heads of Babylonians round? In fact, the question might be a dig at Hillel, right? Because he is an, an, an immigrant. He's emigrated to the land of Israel from, from Babylonia. Oh, somebody figured that out. Oh, good, okay. And how does Hillel respond? Not only is he not irritated, he actually compliments the question. You have asked a great question, an important question. And so he answers the man, and he goes back inside. The man lets a little time pass. I love the way the story puts that detail in. It's, it doesn't, it's not immediate. He lets a little time pass. We're getting even closer to Shabbat, right? He lets a little time pass, and then he comes calling again, even closer to the beginning of Shabbat, to pose yet again a silly question of no particular importance or urgency about the eyes of the Palmyrians. And once again, Hillel compliments the question, and he answers him. And he goes back inside. The man lets a little more time pass. And then he comes calling again, and he poses yet another silly question, this time about the feet of Africans. And without missing a beat, Hillel compliments the question, alta. And the man realizes he's lost his bet. Hillel will not lose his patience or his civility. Or wait a minute. Perhaps civility is patience. Nothing more and nothing less. Hillel remains respectful and patient in the face of the man's deliberately provocative and inconvenient behavior, and it takes the wind out of his sails. Love your enemy, it will drive him crazy. There's no point anymore. He was only in it for the provocation, and if no provocation is forthcoming, well, then he gives up the game. Why does Hillel answer him at all, and why with such civility? Right? Two different questions. Why answer him at all, didn't have to, and why with such civility? They weren't genuine questions that he was asking. This wasn't an ignorant man seeking genuine knowledge. These are deliberate provocations of a troll, we would say today, right? He's trolling Hillel. He's a mischief maker. He simply wants to harass. And the questions do not concern the matter of Torah. So by the rabbi's own rules, Hillel has no obligation, no duty to answer. Why then does he answer? Not because it's a duty to answer, but because it's a virtue to answer and to answer civilly. A virtue, a virtue is an intrinsic good performed for its own sake, not in view of potential consequences and not out of a sense of obligation or duty, but because it is a good. So Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Chia, Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Yossi, and Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Shimon, they exemplified a consequentialist approach. They encountered fools, they determined whether and how to engage them based on the potential harmful consequences of their foolish speech and the relative incorrigibility of the fool, right? What was the likely outcome of their engagement? Raman Gamliel exemplified a duty-oriented ethics. It was a matter of Torah. He answered the fool who was a student because he had a duty to do so. But Hillel exemplifies a virtue-oriented ethics. He answered the fool not out of concern for the consequences. Indeed, the fool's questions are clearly and explicitly of zero importance. Nothing is at stake. He answers the fool not out of a sense of duty. There's no duty in a non-Torah case. He answers the fool because it's an intrinsic good, a virtue. And Hillel is a man who chooses virtue. He answers the fool, and he does so in a way that doesn't make him the equal of the fool. On the contrary, his very civility establishes the difference between them and establishes his virtue. 
Let's move to text nine. It's a very familiar text, I'm sure. And there are many important ideas that emerge from this text, so I don't want to go through the details. I just want to pull out some of the important ideas. This text is important because I think it finally opens a window onto what it means to answer the fool que uh, il valto, according to his folly, which tr has been troubling us from the beginning, or at least me, from the beginning. Right? What, answering the fool according to his folly. Mm, how can that be a positive thing? So this text, I think, is going to help us understand that. And the other important point that's going to emerge from this text is that different people will assess the situation differently. And they will respond according to their assessment and their capacities, for better or for worse. But that is just how life is. So in this very famous passage, we have three non-Jews. First, they come before Shammai. One after the other, they ask to be converted, but on a particular condition that on the face of it is foolish. The first asked to be converted on the condition that Shammai teach him only the written Torah and not the oral Torah, even though rabbinic Judaism asserts two Torot, right? So this seems to be an impossibility. The second asked to be converted on the condition that Shammai teach him the entire Torah while, stand, while he is standing on one foot, a seemingly impossible demand. And the third asked to be converted on the condition that he be made a high priest, a patently impossible demand. Shammai responds to these three ignorant and foolish demands in accordance with verse 5 of Mishlei 26. He doesn't engage the fool. He drives him away with a rod, a stick, the builder's cubit in his hand. So really, the story, I think, is really very much informed by Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5. I think Shammai and Hillel are um, exemplifying the two verses each, and that's why he has that, that builder's amma, the rod, uh, in his hand, if you will. Shammai assesses the situation. This is a fool. He's either wicked or he's ignorant. He seems to me to be incorrigible. I know it's a matter of Torah, but he's a non-Jew. Do I have an obligation to engage with someone outside the Torah about matters of Torah? No. I, my assessment, I do not. I think that this is a case where verse 4 applies. I shall not engage him. And in fact, I, I'm not going to ignore him either. I'm going to drive him away with the rod. Um, perhaps because Shammai knows himself. He knows that if he does engage him, he will lose his patience, and he will become like him, uncivil. But when each of these non-Jews comes to Hillel, he agrees to their condition. He knows that their demands are foolish and impossible, but he doesn't allow their foolishness to be an obstacle to engaging with them. He assesses the situation differently. Yes, they're foolish, probably more out of ignorance than wickedness, and therefore it's probably corrigible. And it is a matter of Torah. Maybe we're not obligated to discuss Torah with non-Jews, but I don't engage with people because it's a duty or because of the consequences. I engage with people because it's a virtue, and therefore it is a virtue to engage with anyone I deem a fool on any topic. And so he agrees to their conditions. What he does is that he meets each fool precisely where he is. OK? The written Torah only? No problem. Sure, on one foot? Yep, we'll do that. High priest? Sure, just make sure you read and sign here that you accept the terms and conditions. Hillel meets each one of these non-Jews where he is. He validates him where he is and establishes trust and slowly leads each one to realize his error, not by rebuking or scolding him, not by lecturing him, but providing him or creating the circumstances or conditions right, in which the person can come to see for himself that his demands were unreasonable and foolish. The change came from inside. And this, I would suggest, is what it means to answer the fool according to his folly in verse 5. Answer the fool it doesn't mean with the same hostility or mockery or incivility or aggression with which he addressed you. It means answer the fool, in, the fool in full acceptance of his current limited capacity and understandings according to his state of foolishness as he is now. Don't hucker down in your superior knowledge 
so that he feels himself belittled and humiliated and excluded and rejected. That will only drive the two of you further apart, make you more entrenched in your opposition to one another. Meet the fool right where he is, hear what he has to say, understand his perspective, and understand what a person standing right where he is standing would need in order to emerge from his ignorance and his folly. That's what it is to answer the fool according to his foolishness. And this is hard to do. And I think we have to be honest that not everyone is in a position to do this. Not everyone can write a play. Not everyone can run a four-minute mile. We have different temperaments. We have different talents. We have different natures. Some are gifted patient, patient teachers. Some are not. Shammai knew that he was not. Better not to engage and become like him. Uncivil, intemperate, fool. Better to send him away. Shammai couldn't escape from his own frame of reference, so far removed from the limited and mistaken understanding of the non-Jew. He couldn't escape from that, enter in empathetically, and move forward. Hillel was capable of it. Hillel has patience. Hillel is a gifted, patient teacher. And fully aware of the deficit in the non-Jew's understanding, he doesn't bring it to his attention directly. Instead, he answers a fool according to his folly. Folly, written Torah only, no problem. Let's start with the Aleph Bey. He enters his frame of reference, and then he helps him find his way forward. The last two Talmudic stories are stories of what happens when we refuse to engage. And more than that, when civil discourse gives way to shaming and shunning and exclusion. The Oven of Achnai story is one of the best known stories in the Talmud. The first half is much more famous, however, than the second half, the tragic conclusion. The good-natured humility that God shows in defeat, right, when he allows the, when the majority of the rabbis overrule him, God's defeated. The good-natured humility that God shows in defeat seems to make very little impression on the rabbis, who despite being victorious, right, you would think they'd be a little humble since they're victorious, but despite being victorious, they show no good-natured humility. And they turn on the defeated Rabbi Eliezer, a sage, and they treat him as a fool. Rabbi Eliezer is, of course, no fool. He merely disagreed with the other rabbis on a certain point of law, and yet he is treated like the fool of Proverbs 26, verse five, 4. Heady from their victory, perhaps, infused with the zealous self-righteousness, that majorities and mobs are so often prone to. The rabbis treat the one who merely disagreed with them as if he were a fool, unworthy of kavod, undeserving of, of protection from humiliation. They don't physically strike him, but they come pretty close. They take everything he has declared pure, they gather it together, and they burn it in a violent and humiliating display of poor sportsmanship. They were the winners. And then they vote to excommunicate him, which of course inflicts grievous suffering on him and arouses the ire of God who stands ready to avenge Rabbi Eliezer against those who are shaming and shunning him. He is neither wicked nor ignorant nor in fact wrong, as it happens. Rabbi Eliezer is beloved of God and he is avenged by God. Now this story, of course, wasn't written by somebody else about the rabbis. It was written by the rabbis it's themselves. We have to remember that. Their capacity for self-reflection and self-critique is enormous and extraordinary. So this is written by the rabbis about themselves. It's a story about the dangers that arise from adopting a posture of self-righteousness and victory, right? The dangers to civility, the loss of civility that arises from the self-righteousness of a majority. We live in a time when the art of civil disagreement is on the wane, when too often our self-righteous certainty about the singular virtue and rationality of our positions leads us, like the rabbis in this story, to the view that those who disagree with us are more than just contrary. They are ignorant or wicked fools, and this label in turn justifies, justifies the abandonment of civility and it encourages both shaming and engagement that, some kind of engagement that humiliates or degrades, or shunning, a complete disengagement. 
The last source is a remarkably self-critical text also, written by the rabbis in criticism of they themselves. And it's about the apostasy of Jesus. And this text proposes a middle way between the approaches that have been modeled here. Jesus makes a foolish remark when his teacher, Rabbi Yoshua ben Parachia, compliments the inn in which they are staying, the achsanya. Jesus thinks he's complimenting the achsanya, <laughs> same word, the female innkeeper. To attribute such a lascivious thought to his teacher, you know, and to, to, to make a remark on it himself, is an insult, and it's also a mark of his own folly. And the teacher bans him. But he bans him with what seems to be a humiliatingly excessive 400 blasts of the shofar. Each and every day, Jesus tries to find his way back to his teacher. He tries to return. And each and every day, he's turned away. Finally, the day comes when Rabbi Yoshua decides, yes, I will accept him when he comes back. But again, in a comedy of errors, his gesture uh, of acceptance is misread, misinterpreted. The body language is misread by Jesus as yet another rejection. And in despair, Jesus apostatizes. Had Rabbi Yoshua been less severe, less disengaged, disciplining Jesus perhaps, while yet drawing him near, the rabbis say, the story might have ended quite differently. The choice between shunning and shaming versus engagement with its possibility for change and integration is seen in the last story that I gave you, the very moving story, actually, of, of Derek Black. It's a very contemporary, relevant example. Derek Black, as I said in the outset, at the outset, um, was born into the insular world of white nationalism, son of Don Black, the founder of the website Stormfront. As a, as a kid, he ran the Stormfront site for children. He was proudly known as the devil child. When he went off to college, and his parents were very afraid of what might happen to him in the multi multicultural environment of college, he hid his white nationalism, his, his Holocaust-denying anti-immigrant views from his college classmates, and he even socialized with liberals. He enjoyed playing video games with, with them and so on. All the while, he continued his daily radio broadcasts decrying the white genocide that was happening under the anti-white radical president Obama. Until one day when his identity was discovered and posted on campus social media. Friends and classmates were shocked and angry, feeling betrayed. Many acted like Shammai or Rabbi Hia, Rabbi Huda. Many ostracized him. Derek moved off campus. He avoided public spaces. But some students felt that ostracizing Derek Black complete disengagement wouldn't accomplish anything. And they began to wonder how they could change his mind. Perhaps he wasn't incorrigible. So one former acquaintance, a Jewish student, is I think the contemporary embodiment of Hillel. He decided to meet Derek Black where he was in his folly. He sat down and he read Stormfront. I'm sure it wasn't easy. He listened to Derek's broadcasts. And one week in September, he sent Derek a text and asked what he was doing that Friday night. And he invited him to his weekly Shabbat dinner, a dinner that he hosted on campus uh, in his campus apartment every week. It was a college with a very small Jewish population, not much Jewish infrastructure. I'll read to you what the passage says in case some of you didn't have time to read it in full. Matthew had spent a few weeks debating whether it was a good idea. Verse 4 or verse 5? Which one should I follow? He and Derek had lived near each other in the dorm, but they hadn't spoken since Derek was exposed on the social media forum. Matthew, who almost always wore a yarmulke, had experienced enough anti-Semitism in his life to be familiar with the KKK, David Duke, Derek Black was the godson of David Duke, and Stormfront. He went back and he read some of Derek's posts on the site from 2007 and 2008. Jews are not white. Jews worm their way into power over our society. They must go. Matthew decided that his best chance to affect Derek's thinking was not to ignore him, ignore him, not to confront him with the builder's rod, but simply to include him. Maybe he'd never spent time with a Jewish person before, Matthew remembered thinking. It was the only social invitation Derek had received since returning to campus, so he agreed to go. The Shabbat meals had sometimes included eight or ten students. This time only a few showed up. Let's try to treat him like anyone else, Matthew remembered instructing them. Not like a fool. 
Derek arrived with a bottle of wine. Nobody mentioned white nationalism or the forum out of respect for Matthew. Derek was quiet and polite, and he came back the next week, and then the next, until after a few months. Nobody felt all that threatened, and the Shabbat group grew, grew back to its original size. On the rare occasions when Derek directed conversation during those dinners, it was about the particulars of Arabic grammar, or marine aquatics, or the roots of Christianity in medieval times. He came across as smart and curious, and mostly he listened. He heard a Peruvian immigrant tell stories about attending a high school that was 90% Hispanic. He asked Matthew about his opinions on Israel and Palestine. They were both still wary, wary of each other, but they also liked each other, and they started playing pool at a bar near campus. Well, slowly, as you know, the conversations proceeded to actually cover Derek's views. What did he really think and what did he believe? And the evidence against some of those views was presented in a civil way. And as time passed and as his friends continued to engage and challenge his ideas, Derek became more confused about exactly what it was he believed. He began to think that his website message threads about Obama's birth certificate were kind of bizarre and conspiratorial. He stopped posting on Stormfront. He ended his radio show. And in time, as you know from reading this, he would sit down one night and write a letter to the Southern Poverty Law Center renouncing his former beliefs. Matthew Stevenson was willing to meet Derek Black right where he was, entering his frame of reference without adopting it or being debased by it himself, and providing just what he needed over the course of more than a year for Derek to find his way out of the ideologies and the hatred he had been born and bred to. Now, who among us could do that? I tell you frankly, had I met Derek Black, I likely would have decided he was incorrigible. In fact, I'm sure I would have decided he was incorrigible. I can be a pessimist sometimes. Like Shammai with the builder's cubit in my hand, I imagine I would have spurned him. I would not have answered that fool, lest in my uncivil rebuke of him I become like him. But maybe there's a role for those people to play too. After all, that is how many people did treat him. He was publicly uh, outed. And he was ostracized. And that set up a moment in which someone like Matthew Stevenson could come in. Matthew Stevenson was capable of believing that perhaps Derek Black could change. For Matthew, verse 4 was the wrong approach. Ignoring and ostracizing, he said that would change nothing. And so he had tried the, verse, the approach of verse 5. He engaged him, he met him where he was, he provided space for his internal realization of a better way. Would that we all find someone to believe in our moments of utter folly, and we've all had them, that we're not incorrigible. Someone who will answer our folly with civility and respect to meet us where we are and accompany us on our path to a better place. How can we deny that to others? Thank you for reading these sources with me.
we, we, we do want to get something out of that text other than just, you know, strike the man down. Um, and I guess I didn't go in the direction that your group went because I think other stories are telling us that, that there are times when someone seems incorrigible. And you do engage them. So I think that the story with the Roman noblewoman, you know, is one where it's saying, no, no, as, as harmful as the consequences are, and even though it's not a matter of Torah and I don't have a duty to engage, I will engage. We, you know, we are going to have a civil conversation with her and try to, so I think that story does that. So I, I, I want to reserve this story be, to be doing something else, actually. And so the way I, I, I draw, derive something from that um, particular story is that there are times when something is, someone is, perhaps incorrigible or something is so 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 wicked and harmful and does have such terrible consequences. Engaging is, is not going to do anything. Engaging will only make you as uncivil as the person, which will delight them and provoke them and fire up their base to be convinced that you are worse than the person themselves, right? So it, it actually only feeds their game. It's, a, it's, your, it's playing their game, and that's a game you can't win because they're experts at it. So um, I think rather than um, seeing it as that, I, I, I took it to, to be a way of saying, um, all right, we're not going to engage you. You're going to say those things, but you should bear the consequences of those words, not me. Don't ask me to be the one who bears the pain of it or the suffering. Uh, I, I refuse to do that. I refuse to be the one to suffer for this, and you have to bear the consequences of it, not me, not my child, et cetera. So that, that's how I understood it, and I, and I think that is a voice we're hearing more and more. Stop asking me to be courteous and polite back or ignore. I, I don't have to be civil to you. I'm not going to engage you, but I also don't have to be civil uh, and I can stand up and say this is, this is just intolerable. Other people, let them play that role. And that's the other thing. I think there are different roles for different people to play based on their, their position, their positionality, their situation, whether you're a bystander versus a victim. I don't think we have a right to dictate to victims how to handle their outrage and their fear. And I think it's perverse to call them snowflakes when they stand up for themselves and cry out in indignation over their treatment from those who are in positions of power. That's a snowflake. To me, that's a powerful lion. Right? And yet we have the temerity to call them snowflakes because they're angry and indignant? No, 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 no. Right? Um, but, there's, but then other people, perhaps less touched in their core identity, they can be the restraint. They can be the one to say, let's try to keep things more civil. I understand your anger. Don't invalidate their anger and indignity. But at the same time, also remind us that ultimately we want to arrive at a place where we're all civil again. I just think we all have different roles to play. Right? And uh, um, we have to figure that out for ourselves. Okay, let's, maybe we'll just kind of go left to right. Maybe I'll take two or three. Would that be a better thing to do? So, um, so we'll have you and then Sarah, and, and then we'll move over to, is Michael, right? Sorry? Jeff. You changed your name since last No, no, sorry, Jeff, hold on. We're going to start here, and then Sarah, and then Jeff. Oh, you, oh <laughs> use Michael sometimes. Um, I keep getting fixated on the bit in Proverbs about the flood. Yeah. And uh, Stop so the metaphor that translates is that once you burst past a, a certain social norm, then you can't bring it back. Um, so I'm wondering if there's something in there that you find about you have to hold a particular line, otherwise when we relinquish these norms, then we're all in the base.
Israel are so far to the left as to be anti-Israel, not merely critical of Israeli policy, which is everyone's favorite heroic activity. Where, right. where do you draw the line? Right. Good. Shailot gdolot. So regarding the... <laughs> and it's almost Shabbat too, because we go later. later. <laughs> um, it's interesting that you... Um, you heard the flood verse in that way because I think that is an important issue. I don't, I, I don't think the verse, the verse is talking about you need to stop their wickedness if you, because that will turn into a flood. But you're saying something different and very important, which is incivility has a way of once you've crossed a certain, right, as we've all seen, once one norm is down, other norms fall very, very quickly. And, you know, it's like those games at the fair where you're hitting the thing on the head that it keeps popping up. You know, I've, what is it, whatever that's called, whack-a-mole, right? Yeah, whack-a-norm. You know, it's, um, it's, but but you, it, it, where do you, what, what do you take on next? You know, uh, which norm? So you're right. But I think that only validates um, the point that the Proverbs verse is making. There are times to say, stop. This is going to start a flood, Right? Um, and so we need to stop incivility on one side. It will lead to a burgeoning of incivility, and I, I take your point, on all sides, right? Not just the increasing falling of norms, but increasing harshness and civility in response to those falling norms. It's a flood from every direction. So maybe we can, maybe that's how we can really understand the Proverbs verse, right? If you stop uh, the fool, then you stop the flood of incivility, not just from the fool, but from every direction. And I think maybe you know that would be a good way to understand that verse. Um, and as for Sarah's point, um, yes, I don't mean to be uh, divvying up roles and responsibilities among people. Absolutely, uh, it's up to in each individual to know their their temperament, their position, what they're capable of. Shammai was in every bit as much a position to help that those those non-Jews with their ignorance as Hillel. There's nothing different about his positionality in society, right? But he knew his own temperament. He knew that he didn't have the patience in that situation on those issues. Perhaps in another, he does. Perhaps the moral salience of that was such for him that he couldn't. But something else, he might be able to be an advocate with a different voice because it's a little lower on his list of things that are morally salient, and so it's one he can have a little more composure about. And it's not that I was saying that uh, the targets of speech have a right to indignation. I wasn't being prescriptive. I'm being descriptive. We cannot expect of people who are the targets of hate, speech, and activity to respond courteously and chastise them for being snowflakes when they do not. That's what I was saying. How they respond, if they respond like Michael Stevenson, or was that, no, Matthew Stevenson, Right? That's amazing. This is someone who himself could have felt so targeted by that, so alienated that a friend of his could have those views. He can't engage, but he didn't. So I wouldn't presume to know where people fall out on the spectrum of postures that you can adopt. And there are people who are not immediately targeted by something but feel so completely empathetic and so completely outraged that they will be the ones to stand up with indignation and outrage, and there's every reason for them to do so and uh, for us to appreciate that they, they understand that to be morally salient for themselves, especially, as you point out, when the targets of some of these, um, this speech are themselves so disempowered. They rely upon, you're right, that's missing um, in these particular texts. So maybe if I expand this, I will try to find a text somewhere, I'm sure there is some, which is more of a bystander, right? When someone is in a position of disempowerment, how does one advocate while not um, erasing the other person's subjectivity, right? There are ways to do that appropriately and not erasing their subjectivity. So that's a, that's a lacuna I will try to fill. Um, and then uh, Jeff's question. Um, it is true um, that I, I did give some more obvious examples, but you're absolutely right. And I, you know, I framed it at the beginning. My examples did not live up to the framing, but I did frame it at the beginning um, as, as something that is going on on both sides. I will, I will give you a couple of examples that disturb me very much. So the, one of the obvious ones is, of course, um, extreme left positions that turn around being as uncivil and delegitimizing and demonizing and animalizing people who hold different views, which again opens the door for every bit 
you know, things that are every bit as dangerous as what's happening on the right. They're guilty as charged, right? That does happen. Absolutely. I, I watched a, a video, uh, and I don't usually do this, but I guess it was in some newspaper or something, and so uh, I clicked on it because it was a triumphalist um, look at this poor uh, Klansman, or I think maybe it was a Klansman or a white, white supremacist, uh, in some kind of a march or something. Uh, oh, he's, he shows up as a counter-protest to some kind of a march. I don't know what the, the protest was. Perhaps it was a, you know, an immigration protest. And he takes the sign of one of the protesters to rip it up. I don't know if any of you saw this. But it was made of some kind of material or fabric where you can't rip it up. And he's trying and trying. And soon, before you know it, there's somebody's videotaping him on their camera. They say, go ahead, rip it up, go ahead. And soon, a small crowd is there mocking him. And I'm watching this, and I'm getting more and more uncomfortable. And I'm, I'm starting to feel real panic and real anxiety because there's a mob against this person, and I know that he's a Klansman. <laughs> I know he's a counter-protester. I know he has ideas that I despise. But I started to hyperventilate watching the mob against this person and mocking him for being unable. He was a, he was, and he was getting more and more embarrassed and more and more flustered and so on. And in, and in that moment, he was, he was a human <laughs> who was being set upon by a crowd as far as I was concerned. Um, so that happens. Um, the, the, and I tried, that was the point of the text dealing with um, the rabbis themselves. The rabbis who are supposedly the heroes, right? The rabbis who are the good guys. But in their self-righteous and in their sense of their majority, and they are so um, yeshar be'enehem, right? Their their derech is so yeshar be'enehem that they can treat even one of their own as if he is a wicked fool and an enemy, uh, and shun and shame him. Um, to my mind, that was a way of saying, let's be critical of ourselves. Um, when we, in our own position of our own uh, political views or views that we agree with, when we adopt these behaviors, we have to be critical of that as well. So it's not, it's not the issue. It's the behavior and the, and the tenor. Um, but I will work to make that a little bit more explicit. What can we do about those people, you asked? Well, Matthew Stevenson and Hillel would say, meet them where they are and educate them. It's long, hard path. Look how long it took Matthew Stevenson, right? That, that's a long journey, Derek Black had. It took uh, what, over a year, um, and uh, it, meetings every Friday night for over a year. It's hard work, and it takes the right kind of person to do it. Thank you very much.